Okay, hello, my name is Krzysztof Valas. I'm from Poznan University of Technology and I'll be hosting today's talk uh, together with my colleague uh, Marco Bilonic, who will be moderating. Um, but the star and the, the main point of our today's uh, meeting is the presentation from Marco Huter. Uh, he's a head of robotics system labs uh, from ETH Zurich and also a co-founder of Anibotics. And in his talk today, he's gonna tell us more about the autonomy part for Animo and the latest developments on this side. So floor is yours, Marco. I'm happy to, to hear uh, about cool new stuff from your lab. Thanks, Christoph, for the nice intro and also a warm welcome from my side to this virtual ICRA workshop talk. So in the next 30 minutes, I'm going to give you a little bit of an update of what we are doing uh, primarily at ETH in our research lab, but also a little bit of what is happening at Anibotics towards commercialization of legged systems, um, namely animal. I think in this crowd, there is no big need to actually motivate why it's interesting and, uh, and necessary to have uh, legged systems and what it can be useful for. Nonetheless, I would like to show you this collection of images as a of my personal motivation of why we should have legged systems and what we want to use them for to deploy in these all these kinds of uh, crazy environments where we have a lot of dirty and dangerous jobs that today still need to be done uh, by humans. So in my eyes, it's, it's very nice to see that robots uh, can run very fast, can jump very high and everything, but in the end, what we should really target is to leverage this mobility advantage that we are potentially having to deploy them to do something good in these types of environments. And really the core problems that I'm seeing here, if we want to achieve that, is that these environments are on one side permanently changing. They are never the same. Um, they have been, there's dynamic uh, elements in there. So the robot has to deal with a lot of uncertainty in its environment, and that's particularly challenging. Uh, for mobility. Um, our team has been involved in developing uh, primarily quadrupedal systems, which today I would say are quadrupeds in general, some of the, the most advanced legged systems that we can find uh, out there. There has been about 10 years of research that we have invested in, in, in this uh, field, developing a series uh, of different machines. You see in these two videos on the bottom left and bottom right, uh, the B series of animal, which was still originated from research work that we did at ETH, and uh, now the latest generation, Animal C, which is a commercialized product by our ETH spin off uh, Anibotics, who is primarily using this and distributing this for industrial uh, inspection maintenance uh, work. Um, I hope many of you have seen the B version at uh, previous conferences and challenges and stuff. We were planning to bring some of the C robots uh, to this year's ICRA, which unfortunately wasn't possible. So I would like to spend a little time here to give you also some updates in uh, what the machine is, what kind of feature that it has, and then later I uh, show you uh, where we are using it for. Um, so the latest generation Animal C is uh, equipped with a bunch of uh, perception sensors that we have all around uh, the main body. So there's like four real sense sensors in front and to the side, which allow us to do obstacle detection and uh, local elevation mapping that we need for uh, local planning. And then we have it equipped with a, a LiDAR sensor on top to do like full 3D scanning and localization to make it autonomous. There is like uh, two wide angle cameras in the front and in the back, which can be used for, of course, various types of uh, applications and, and research um, areas. And then on top of it, there is a payload capacity, which can be very flexible. There's some standard payloads, which um, like, for example, this pan tilt hat that has a zoom camera, thermal camera, and some lights included which is primarily used for industrial inspection. But of course you can modify this as you wish. And that's primarily interesting for us researchers. If you wanna modify the machine, so there is like USB interfaces, there is a Ethernet interface and you have power 
plus there's a dedicated uh, compute system on board that allows us to run any application we want. Now, looking back at the images that I showed you at the beginning of where we are targeting to deploy the systems, I think one of the, the key elements that these robots have to feature is that they are extremely robust. Um, this uh, Animal C is uh, fully waterproof, it's IP67, which means that we can even dive. It's also fallproof, fall safe, so that in case the robot falls over, it doesn't get damaged and we can uh, recover the operation. Um, that's certainly interesting for us, but it's even more interesting if you or important if you want to deploy such a machine uh, for industrial uh, applications. But in the end, end users really require to have this kind of standards uh, being implemented. The machine as it comes today is a lot stronger and faster than we have uh, in its current version, which allows us to do, of course, more fancy locomotion control with it. Uh, over the last month, we have been releasing the first larger production batch of this Animal C series, which has been delivered uh, to the customers. And I will show you in the following a couple of examples of how we researchers at ETH uh, use, with it, uh, use it for. Now, commercial deployments is one thing, um, which is probably not too interesting for the crowd here listening to this uh, talk. Um, but there's also another mission that we want to follow with that, namely that we have been planning from the very beginning to have this animal uh, series as a tool, as a development tool to advance research and also open knowledge in like robotics. A couple of years ago, we created this animal research uh, community, uh, which essentially provides open code, shares code among different participants where we can have a very active uh, discourse and there's also extensive documentation of hard and software. So today we are having more than 150 researchers that collaborate on different applications and research topics uh, with animals. And I think like a couple of the following speakers like Maurice or maybe also Christoph will talk about some of their work that they're doing in this uh, framework. Um, I want to take the opportunity here to show you some of our stuff, which is related to the workshop name so towards real world deployments of legged systems and the real world that we are looking at is um, this type of, of different environments search and rescue uh, underground areas sewer and mines we also do some work in forest and then the dominant area where antibiotics is operational is for industrial inspection and there from a commercial uh, point of view now to make robots work in these types of environment we need to have robust and reliable uh, locomotion control. And there's essentially, as we have seen in also other talks, um, a lot of uh, planning and control algorithms uh, that are out there, which we typically assume to have a high level reference command coming from a user or a navigation planner. They have a planner, which a motion planner, which generates motions, photos, interaction forces. A tracker which tracks the desired behavior to generate joint level commands. And this tracker, most of the time, is some sort of inverse dynamics, whole body control, often with uh, some hierarchical objectives, uh, prioritized tasks. I think like this is very fairly well understood, so I, I don't want to spend a lot of time in that. It's a little more tricky on uh, the planning level. I think here really the holy grail is to have a planner that can be executed very fast, such that in case of a disturbance, like a change in the environment, disturbance to the robot, you can very rapidly uh, replan. As you have seen, for example, in the talk of uh, Jonathan on Monday, um, researchers often use simplified templates for this, like inverted pendulums or slip models or CMP models, stuff like that, to very quickly optimize uh, reference motions uh, and photos. Now uh, with like growing compute power and also a lot more efficient uh, optimization algorithms, these models uh, can grow in complexity to cover like more effects. Um, we are dealing a lot with um, lump single body models, central dynamics. And I think now we're like reaching a level where one can run joint optimization of footholds 
and motion using a full body dynamics at like multiple of uh, and tens of, of hertz uh, on board, so online. Now the optimization framework that we are widely using is a sequential linear quadratic program, which is a type of constraint DDP method originally proposed uh, by Farbot a couple of years ago. If you want to play around with that, it's uh, available uh, online. I think a lot of the core contribution that happened also from our side over the last couple of years is how we deal with the specific uh, different types of constraints that we're having on like hybrid systems like uh, leg droplets. Now having a uh, planner is one thing, but then the question is, how do we bring this plant motion on uh, the actual system? Now, what people typically assume is that this model, which they use for rolling out the dynamics, captures all important elements, and particularly if you have like your full body dynamics there, which in fact I would say is certainly not true. In um, particular, I think robots have a lot of uh, like elements which make them non-ideal, in particular in the actuators, where we have limited uh, bandwidth, so effects that we never really capture in these models. Now, to enable deployment of such a framework uh, on animal, uh, Ruben has uh, come up last year with a contribution which allows us to um, shape the cost function in frequency domain, and hence cope with that. And um, the second element, Chris, the second element is that your optimizer typically runs not as fast as you want. So if you have tens of hertz here and we run a couple of hundreds of hertz on the tracking control, there's a discrepancy there. And to cope with this issue, uh, we also did some feedback policy optimizations. Instead of just looking at the feed forward behavior that we're generating with the planner, we're also looking at the feedback behavior. Um, let me select the pointer here. So the, the feedback part that we're generating from that and use that in order to stabilize the system. So there's areas or times when the system has to react stiffer and times where the system has to react more relaxed. And integrating this feedback policy directly from the optimization has helped a lot in like not having to fine tune cost functions depending on gates and depending on behaviors and robots, but have them more or less equal across all kinds of different maneuvers that you see, for example, in this video uh, down here. Now we're using this same type of algorithms also on variants of animal. So what you see here is uh, animal with wheels. So we integrated actuated wheels at the point of the feet, it was work by uh, Marco Bielanich, uh, where we essentially want to combine the advantages of both worlds, of so wheeled systems and legged systems, so becoming very fast and at the same time maintaining the versatility uh, in our locomotion. Um, there's the same control algorithms, algorithms that can run there. Of course, what has to change is the different types of constraints that we're having due to uh, rolling. And what you create is in essence a motion which is on one side fast, as you can see here, and on the other side also very reactive. But of course, you go fully to get the same reactiveness as you had before in the uh, lecture. Quick question. Um, can you guys hear the sound of the video now or not? We can hear it. We can hear the sound. Okay, sorry for that. Can I turn this off somehow? Now, now we cannot hear the sound, but it's also not playing. It's, the video is over. Thanks. Anyway, so you have to live with that.
Now, if you want to deploy it on in, in real world, what is missing here is that we have to add perception to the system. And this perception really has a direct link and a very tight link both with the planning uh, and the controller. And what we need to have is one side a very fast map of the environment available for this planning. Uh, since our planner has to also run very fast, you need to have a fast update rate of how the environment uh, looks like. So what we developed here is a GPU-based uh, elevation mapping pipeline that allows us to generate uh, at like 50 hertz or something like the, the local environment of uh, the robot, which is then used uh, for foothold planning. On the foothold planning side, uh, Fabian, uh, in his recent work, developed a batch search um, algorithm, which essentially looks at the cost of the terrain, like slopes, edge, roughness, which you don't want to see, incorporates kinematic limits and collisions, uh, as well as stability of the body in order to find the optimal uh, foothold. Um, now this search is implemented so efficient that you can really run at control frequency, and hence the optimization does not only happen once the lift off with the foot, but really at any instant uh, of time. And that has um, largely improved efficiency of the robot uh, against disturbances uh, in the environment or also uh, from external uh, collisions. You see here the robot walking across different uh, types of terrains. From time to time, you also spot instances where the terrain is moving, which means that we had to implement also some sort of impedance stabilization in order to cope uh, with this uh, motion on the ground. Um, this test that we are doing here on one side showed the possibilities of what can be done if perception and control and planning work together very nicely. At the same time, it also indicated a couple of uh, limitations uh, that you're having with these robots as they are uh, today. For example, if you have like really high obstacles and you don't go for like full body contact situations, um, there is uh, limits in, in step heights and stuff like that, if not accounting for like full body uh, collision models and so on. Now, beside model-based planning and control, an alternative method to use is that we are building upon uh, data-driven approaches and here primarily uh, focus on reinforcement learning. Um, some years ago, two years ago, we showed for the first time how this can be done uh, in the work of uh, Jemin. They essentially used on one side very fast simulation in order to generate data and we coupled this on the other hand with learned models from the real robot in order to compensate for this gap between what is simulated and what is uh, the real robot. Again, particularly the actuator dynamics which have to be integrated in that and used reinforcement learning in order to generate uh, behaviors like this. You can like throw over the robot, recovers from that, and gets back to, to operations again. And what's interesting is like you can put this to an arbitrary uh, configuration and eventually um, we'll go back. eventually figure out the way to get up from that and continue to operate. So see here, you know how, throw, how it throws down the robot and gets back to operation again afterwards. I think that shows a little bit of where mobility can go, where robustness can go. Question is like if a robot falls now, is it unstable once it can get up and continue operation or not? All this preliminary work that we are doing here was done in lab environment on relatively flat ground. And the open question that remains is like, how does that translate or transfer to rough environment? The conditions as we have set in the first images where the robot has to conquer all kinds of natural grounds. There's two problems addressed to that. The first thing is that it's on one side impossible to model all of these environments in simulation. And even if you could model, it's also hard to sense it from your perception and then to infer uh, what it is. And actually, if we look at it in more detail, even if we would know what type of environment we have, and we have like tons of sensors to measure it, 
it's actually unclear of what kinds of sensor signal, in what way you're using the sensor signal in order um, to, to locomote. So what we are doing here is we took the same control architecture or similar control architecture that we had before. We were training a um, control policy to run on that, but then in this version, we gave it all the time, all the different um, available information about its local environment, like contact state, contact forces, terrain profiles, friction coefficients. And we create a network which decodes as latent information that is used by our controller in order to make it run across different types of environment. Now, knowing that this information here is not available on the real system, we then created a temporal convolution network, which essentially from history of data sensed by the robot. So all proprioceptive data uh, can infer the same information that is used by the controller. And we trained this using adaptive uh, terrain curriculum, so starting on simple grounds, once the robot gets better and better, um, we make it more challenging. And actually it turned out that this uh, architects really allowed us to um, train control policies that can run across all kinds of different uh, challenging grounds. You see here a couple of deployments with both robots like Animal B and Animal C in uh, nature, going through riverbeds where they have <clears throat> many slippery objects, stones that can move, vegetation that the robot might get stuck. There's to deal with these types uh, of situation. Now, it's pretty interesting if you look in detail what is happening in these types of environment and what is happening also in the robot. So we took it back uh, to the lab and prepared a couple of uh, lab experiments. And one of them, here you can see slippery grounds, let's know. Um, one of the experiments was what happens if there's a step in the way. And you see the robot like running into the step and then exploiting a reflex and getting across the step. That's all without like hand crafting or hand tuning. And even does it if you add additionally 10 kilos of payload that the robot doesn't know about. So it's becoming uh, pretty robust. And it's interesting if you look in details what is happening in the underlying networks, which essentially show you, so I don't dive into too much detail here, but what this map shows you is a kind of a sensitivity map between the different channels that we're having to the actual commands. And you see that stuff that has happened some time ago from the last time I'm collided, the robot collided with the object, trigger the behavior now such that the robot makes a reflex and steps uh, higher. And all of that like really like zero shot generalization, you train it in simulation and you let it run on unknown uh, environment um, directly without any adaptation on the real system. Now, these are the two worlds, but of course, there's also some way that we can go in between. So we have seen that model-based optimization is very nice as it can provide optimal and very robust solutions, as long as you can solve it online and very fast. But it's extremely involved from a computational point of view. On the other side, we have RL technologies, which can be very sample inefficient, takes a lot of time to train these policies. But once you have the trained policies, like deployment on the real system is, doesn't take any compute at all. Now the idea here is, could we maybe combine advantages uh, of both sides? So in the work of Jan, uh, that he presented also this year at ICRAN, he essentially used MPC as a demonstrator. Now instead of like the often used imitation learning, which tries to clone commands or infer a uh, cost function from that, we really start from the first principles of optimal control, uh, where we know more or less that uh, the optimal control solution minimizes the Hamiltonian. And by this also satisfies all kinds of different constraints that we're embedding there. And what we do is that we use this Hamiltonian as a policy loss function, which means that there is no loss function tuning uh, in reinforcement learning and the constraints are automatically encoded. We can use this MPC as a sort of oracle to kind of query at 
any time, any state, and generate the necessary components for the Hamiltonian, which is then using for the policy search. And of course, there's some tricks that had to be implemented for the details uh, go to the paper, but what is very nice is that in the end, you essentially get a policy which is doing the same as the, M uh, as the MPC controller, but it's doing this with almost no in almost no evaluation time. And also for training, it takes very little time. So here was like less than 10 minutes uh, of MPC data that was required um, to generate that. The second type of work that we were doing in this intersection between uh, learning-based methods and uh, um, uh, model-based approaches uh, was uh, DeepGate by Vasilis. And there's a couple of elements that came in here. On one side, we essentially um, took the structure that we typically have in a model-based approach. So gate planner, which plans faces, which means a set of locations of footholds, body poses together with their timing, while then the gate controller generates a joint level command to follow the plan. And both is learned as a policy. Um, now for the planner, normally one would need to use a simulator together with the controller to forward simulate and check visibility of that. Um, in this work, we go a different way and uh, use a model-based feasibility approach, which uh, is called CROC formulation that essentially evaluates the feasibility of the transition from one phase to a, uh, another phase as a simple LP problem um, and independent of any controller. Then you can back this up additionally with like uh, some, some um, terrain constraints and also some collision models in order to and train to complete uh, finally that. And also this, um, sorry, it's not playing. Sorry, it is not playing, but anyway, uh, check out the, the video of Vasilis. Uh, you're gonna see this all in very much detail. Now, with that, we have uh, a whole set of controller that allows us to deploy, deploy our robots in, in various real world uh, environments. Uh, one of the um, types of, of conditions or the, let's say, one of the um, main environments where we're testing it right now is for the DARPA sub challenge where there's like multiple underground areas, like this example of um, the urban challenge that happened a year ago in close to Seattle. They essentially had the robot to explore a old nuclear power plant. You see here animal that is the B series, um, autonomously walking through this uh, environment. On the top left, you see the front camera, bottom left is what the elevation map is generating, which is used for traversability estimation and foothold planning. Then you have a free space estimate on the right bottom, and right top shows you the map that is generated online. There's several elements that play here together. On one side, we have a graph-based exploration planner, which was developed together with Gosses Alexis Group, where we search for the optimal area where the robot should continue to explore based on also its uh, locomotion capabilities and uh, the gain of information that we're having there. There is a, a Violome version uh, running for doing the slams of so localization and mapping of the environment. And we have a traversability estimation based on this local elevation uh, that we're having for doing the local uh, path planning to avoid obstacles in the runtime. And then lastly, a robust uh, locomotion controller, which in that case was this uh, learned uh, locomotion controller that I showed you uh, before. Um, this mission that we were doing here typically lasted all in all one hour. One robot of us was usually about 30 minutes uh, on the run. In this time, we we're covering an area like this is a couple of hundred meters of distance, so a long tunnel at the entrance, going around the building, around the reactor building, exploring all of that uh, autonomously. Uh, we had some issues with artifact reporting, but uh, the exploration navigation was uh, pretty okay. All the locomotion turned out to be extremely robust. You hear the robot walking downstairs blindly. It was a pretty steep industrial stair. Uh, however, you can could cope with, cope with that, like uh, walk downstairs here. 
The second application, which we are running together with uh, colleagues who are also organizing uh, the workshop, is a sewer and mine inspection, uh, where we have the robots in that case exploring underground areas in the sewers uh, of Zurich, where we search for cracks and deteriorated uh, concrete. Now, the challenges uh, when going in these types of environment is typically that you're walking in the shit. So, assume that you have this tube on the ground but your feet are literally in the shit, which means you cannot infer from your extraceptive perception what types of ground that you're having. The question is what kind of terrain profile do we infer? How do we adapt uh, uh, the, surf, the, the ground reaction profiles in order not to slip or slide? So what you're developing here was a adaptive and sensorized foot which um, measures the load of information that allows us to adapt the reaction to the profile that we're not seeing that we're moving Now, what we've seen now is deployment of robots, legged robots, in a at least partially autonomous way on different underground areas. And there's like three components that were important for that. We have perception, planning, and control. And if I look at this workshop stock that we're seeing here, we see a lot of control and planning, a little bit of perception. I think in the meanwhile, there's even more planning than control, and primarily these two things are, are merged together. Um, on the other side, when we talk about the real world deployments, if you compare this, for example, to car industry, autonomous cars, so autonomous driving has become a complete perception problem. There's almost no research on the rest anymore, like people have to fully focus on the perception side of things. So there's a huge discrepancy here. And actually, if we look at these initial images that I showed you, I would even say that the types of environments where we would like to deploy legged systems are even more challenging than cars driving on the street. So that should by no means disqualify uh, research or perception research that is done in the uh, autonomous driving sector, but it should rather make us aware of that and hopefully refocus also in the future that we see in this workshop a lot of talks happening on the perception side and primarily also how this perception is like tightly integrated with uh, planning and control to make our robust more robust uh, our robots more reliable and robust so the prior prior limits that i'm seeing here is that today uh, like a robots research uh, typically looks at geometry and if you look at geometry it's primarily uh, 2.5 T, and we use this to uh, classify traversability and to optimize for the footholds. That's perfectly fine as long as you're in an environment like this. It's getting a lot more tricky once you want to deploy them in real nature. Um, we have been working on this uh, in, the, in the PhD of uh, Lawrence Wellhausen in how can we use haptic information that we sense on the ground together with perception in order to predict quality of environments, in particular for vegetation, so stuff like that, which is very hard to qualify purely from a geometric point of view. So we look at what we, we, we see stuff that we also touch, which allows us to then infer the quality of these footholds and decide for whether the case we can of walk fully self supervised learning, Sorry, yes, terrain transitions are ideal. Um, but you can walk on these so areas that are safe and areas that are unsafe. Now, the main problem is that typically these self-supervised learning methods, what happens is that once you have stuff that you have never seen before, this binary classification tends to be overconfident and just says, like, just walk through this. And that's, of course, uh, very risky. So work that uh, Lawrence presented this year was that we essentially want to generate features from uh, multimodal uh, perception input. So we look at every single foothold, we look at the information that is coming from the color camera, depth information, um, also surface normal, surface angles, and things like that, and pump this multimodal sensor information through a convolution neural network in order to generate um, a distribution of features. And we look at how this distribution looks like and only select the ones which have a high likelihood of uh, being available, available and classify this as safe and walk only through this thing. And um, luckily this video has no sound, 
And that allowed us to essentially train in, in certain environments and have a safe deployment in other environments where the robot hasn't been before. You see in this video how uh, on flat ground, the information that we're seeing really allows us to classify stuff as safe very easily. Once you have reflections and things, it's getting more uh, hard. But then if you have like completely unknown scenes or situations like this, there's a guy in lighting a fire. See how the robot wants that there's a fire. The robot knows it hasn't seen this before. It hasn't encountered this before. It starts classifying this as unsafe so it can navigate around. So these are only some preliminary works in, in this direction, but it shows a little bit the direction of where I think we should move on in order to make these machines a lot more versatile in the near future. With this, I would like to stop here. Thank you all for your attention. Maybe there's a couple of people who want to join our team uh, in the future. If you want to have more information, check out our homepage and YouTube channels. If you want to collaborate, any more research is the direction to go. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Marco. Uh, um, it was very nice and very dense talk. Um, we have a couple of questions from our uh, participants. So first of them is from Dimitro, Dimitrios, um, and he's asking about the challenges of going from simulation to the real world, so this reality gap. What specifically do you want to know? So we need to ask Dimitrios. Dimitrios, what do you want? I mean, the, the reinforcement learning part where, uh, you know, you, you have to train in uh, some simulated environment, but then obviously the real, the real robot is a bit different uh, and the environment is different. So do you face any issues on, on this uh, transition? So, I mean, if you look back to the talk that Jonathan gave on Monday, that showed a little bit the issues, right? So they trained in the lab environment and that worked on the treadmill, but then once it was operated on different types of uh, grounds like uh, I think he was saying on concrete and grass and stuff they had issues with like slip which is sliding so it's not the right properties that you're simulating and same thing that happened to us so when we had the first train policy and let it run on slippery grounds which is sliding around and it was running across obstacles it got stuck it didn't know how to start lifting legs more um, so what you had to do is like this randomization of the environment, which helped a lot in the sense that the robot could then distinguish between the different terrains that it has encountered in simulation and essentially have the real world deployment being a mixture or a subset somehow that was felt in one of these randomized environments. I think it's still an ongoing challenge. It's not something that is solved and will open up a lot of additional potential for, for future research. Okay, so the next question is about the application. So the, we've got Poppy team. And so, they, so the person says that this is like, uh, there are tons of applications, but uh, for now there are a few markets outlets. And there are also like huge competition uh, in the market of legged robots. So the question is, how do you plan to compete in this for now closed market and are you optimistic about it? Um, so I think right now, all the different players that are bringing legged like robots to the market, they still have to develop the market. It's not like something that is there and then people know there's like this huge need from today on and there's only, uh, you have to make machines and, and deploy them. It's also about developing the market together with uh, end users. I have the feeling that now Boston Dynamics has uh, robots, uh, Unitree has robots, and we have a couple of US companies that have robots, as well as UK people that bring robots uh, on the market. And this, there will be a lot more. So I'm not, uh, I think there's a lot more, there's a lot more markets that will grow in this once people start realizing what these machines are all uh, useful for. Um, to me, this is like uh, legacy systems, and again, like this connects very much to what Jonathan was saying in his talk. You're gonna see legged like, robots in applications where today we don't even think about. And particularly even not us think about that, but think about the potential end user. So they don't see these, these, these things and this has to grow over time. So I'm expecting these markets to just massively grow. For the time being, 
the, the biggest uh, um, area for us as any botics where we invest and where we see the, the, the first applications is for industrial inspection and hopefully later also maintenance. So once the robot gets becomes an actor and can interact with the environment for the time being is primarily inspection. So there we have a lot of sites. Think about an offshore site where we have to fly out people to do inspection tasks. It's very dangerous, just like in the North Sea, they're crashing like once a year a helicopter or people that fly out there to do some inspection maintenance works. I think there's lots of areas there. We have this underground uh, project together also with uh, Christoph's group uh, and Maurice's group where we do inspection of mines. Also there are like thousands of people that have been sent underground. Some of them are not really required once you have robots. That like it's a huge leverage for safety. Okay, so next question is also from Dimitrios. Uh, so maybe he will direct, direct, directly ask this question in the ear, I think, Dimitrios. No, I guess we can combine the, the next two. So mine and the, and the next is uh, basically, uh, the, the next one is, is a bit better. So which, which approach has yield more robust gates? It is data-driven, model-based, model-free, mixed, uh, it's it's very depending on the environment, on what you want to do with it. If we think about these rough terrains, completely unknown, in particular, if we think about slippery grounds, we have seen more robust gates through learning. If you had situation where we wanted to, like high level, nicely handcraft certain behaviors, doing uh, steps across um, gaps, doing maneuvers which uh, required static ways of locomoting and was more the model based side. Um, honestly, I think like both areas will continue. It's not like one taking it all. Um, but it's really depending on how we use them. Okay, thank you very much. And um, there's one more question, but I also think it is uh, you have to invite to the animal research. There's a question that there's extensive documentation, hardware and software available online. Uh, so there's a question about the link and how you can access those things. Here's the link on that slide. Okay. Okay, are there any other questions from our audience? Yes, I would like to ask something. So a couple of <laughs> days ago, we had Jonathan Hurst talk, who is the CTO of Agility Robotics. And there, I think they asked him a really nice question. Um, what he thinks about startups that are now going into hardware development of robots. And he really went in depth into the challenges that comes with in investors that are, um, that are having troubles to invest in these kinds of um, companies because it's so risky. And what is your recommendation? What is your rec um, experience for people that would like to go in, into the same direction as you? So I think one of the um, statements that Jonathan made, which re resonated with me uh, completely was people that invest money, they don't like to spend so much money that is required to build up hardware. Hardware takes a lot of time to make a product and gain money and it takes uh, hence also a, a lot of money to, to go to that place. Um, so that's much easier if you just do software. Um, on the other hand, I think now we are getting to a situation where the understanding of what is required to build these robots and what is required to control these robots, that makes it easier for new people to develop their own businesses and maybe make a specialized machine for that specific application or this application. So what you see right now are still relatively general purpose systems. Uh, if you look at other areas, um, if you look at HEVs and things, they are very specialized, they're becoming specialized, maybe heavy lifting stuff, maybe construction stuff, maybe small things for exploration, whatever. I think there's lots of opportunities there in like also diversifying on the hardware side. Um, I would say the way to market or the way to business has never been better than now, looking back. Because like also 
There's a lot of actuation that is developed now by different companies all around the world that is getting available. Sensors are much more accessible at uh, low cost, same for compute. Uh, I think this opens up a lot of opportunities also for new people. Do you also see a difference between Europe and the US? For you being in Europe that the way how people here think about long-term investment compared to in the US, do you see a difference or do, do you see similar trends in Europe? Um, I think like the investment market has become pretty uh, global. If you look at uh, startup companies that we have in Central Europe, in Europe in general, a lot of them have also a US investor, a lot of them have also Asian investors. So this is all across. You have Boston Dynamics that has an Asian investor with uh, an East Asian um, money giver. So like this is becoming pretty global. The, from like more from a historical point of view, I think the general opinion is that in Europe, money is harder to get for high risk businesses than for example, in the US. So I see many colleagues that create startup companies in the US where they can raise money with very little development, which is uh, done so far. But that being said, and that's again relating to what Jonathan mentioned, like for harder companies, it might not be the same. So a lot of investors require a short term um, impact of their money that they get a, a quick return and that's not so easy or harder. Thank you. Okay, so there's also a question if you envision like version of animal working in the nuclear field, so you, you mentioned the sub challenge, but is it like possible to, to, to have the animal uh, complete missions in these environments? So the, the SAPTI challenge was urban in general. It was uh, abandoned uh, nuclear power plants. So there is no need for radiation hardening and stuff like that. I think in general, like critical infrastructure, at some point also operational infrastructure are an area where things are, are uh, useful. So uh, it's hard to say. And uh, it's also, we have to see a bit the difference of what we are investigating as researchers at ETH and what is the short-term business cases of uh, any optics. And these are two different uh, directions. And um, just to reiterate on that, I think like the, the quick businesses are on surveillance, inspection, these types of areas, and all the other ones uh, might come later. Okay, and the, the follow-up questions, but this is like not very related, is that uh, we see the, larger and larger gap between what is taught in robotics and what is the state of the art of the research. So um, do you think it would be poss possible to fill this gap? So, Can you um, repeat? So the difference between what? Uh, education. So studies of robotics. So we learn, we teach and also learn about the kinematics, dynamics and everything. And the state of the art is now shifting more to, let's say, machine learning optimization and I think uh, many universities start adapting their curriculum as they have been doing in the past all the time. So if there's new stuff coming in, uh, things that show to have a more importance, things that are becoming tools for everyone. So for example, machine learning has become like math. For many areas, it's just a tool that people use. It's not something they continue to develop. So at ETH, we are discussing of having uh, undergrad machine learning classes uh, specifically for all directions as basic courses. And that's happening in all different universities. Now specifically for, for robotics, which I see still as a application area of machine learning. Also there, there is an ongoing development. I think uh, while people have previously taught primarily stationary robotic systems, this is more and more uh, driven towards mobile devices, towards maybe legged systems, humanoid systems, more versatile systems. There's other things that you need to know for that and for the other. Okay, thank you very much. It seems that we finished our round of questions. Uh, so I would say the huge round of applause for our speaker, but it might not be heard. 
so thank you very much, <laughs> uh, Marco. And we, we also invite you for the next talks that we are scheduling for next week. Um, once more, thank you for your time and sharing your knowledge with us. And thank you for my uh, co-hosts uh, in this meeting. And see you soon. Thanks. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.